welcome to the Ramon Foster Show, brought to you by the Get-Go Cafe and Market. He is Ramon in Hendersonville, Tennessee. I'm Dan Kovacevic of DK Pittsburgh Sports in Pittsburgh. And Ramon, it is getaway day, locker clean-out day, exit meetings day here in Pittsburgh. And what does that mean? Take me through that, because you've been through not just the whole sudden Wow, we're actually done. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, like especially like in, in, in a tough one like Denver, where yeah. you're just you're con- you just convinced you're moving on. Fuse, yeah. And the next thing, you're sitting in an office with a clipboard and your positional coach, and, and yeah. everyone's like giving you like, wait a second, really? That's it? <laughs> I know. Uh, locker clean out day, man. Black Monday, however you want to call it. End of the season is what it is. And this is a unique day, man, because coaches try to keep it within perspective because there's a lot. One, the season just ended. Two, there's a lot of heartbreak in there. There's a lot of confusion. There's a lot of fed upness, too, uh, with the end of the season because as, as banged up as guys are, as tough of a season as it can be, You still at the end of the season, and every year I felt this way. No lie. Even if I was tired, banged up, just like even ready to be done at a point, you're just like, man, I know we're running out of gas. You can be real about those things too, but as soon as that season ends, you're sitting in your locker, and I'm sure you saw a little of this too from some of the guys as you're interviewing. There's despair. Like, dang, that's it. This is done for the season, and now I got to think through the process of what's next. And coach, for the most part, man, will let guys decompress in the locker room. Not really much of a, uh, of, of announcements other than, hey, we're going to announce the schedule moving forward. Coach Gee, Garrett Guimont, the head and, uh, strength and conditioning coach, he's going to get a schedule together by the time we land or by the time Monday come around. We'll have information for you. And it somewhat goes like this on the plane uh, coming back. It'll be a situation where, hey, fellas, uh, exit meetings are set up for – Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, if you're still in town, everybody to uh, every young guy. And it'll go like this. Rookies, guys who are up for a contract, guys who just want to talk to the coach. It's a must that we see you. It's those situations. Free agents, rookies, automatic. Don't matter where you are or undrafted guys. We need to see you in the office. Get with your coach and we'll go from there. And uh, let's, let's say on a Monday after a game or after that loss at the end of the season, Coach Tomlin to have his uh, meeting, talk guys through a little bit and say, hey, all right, man, break it up with the uh, with your coordinators and from there go to your position coach to sign up for your meetings. And their slots set up from Tuesday for the rest of the week and even the next week if you need to because everybody for the most part kind of want to get in and out of town. But there is a level of business that's got to happen before that actually goes down, specifically rookies, specifically free agents. And there's no better meeting to have, if I can be honest, uh, if you're a free agent that made it out of the season healthy, too. Because then you get a, 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 a sense of, you know, you get a, a meeting, a face-to-face meeting uh, to really ask those hard questions to the head coach, your position coach. And I always went and talked to Kev Colbert and we'll have a brief conversation with Mr. Rooney, too. Not in the sense of, you know, hey, what are you guys going to do for me? But... I got to a point with Kev to where, you know, we, we'd have to be realistic about stuff, especially, let's say, going into that third contract. Kev, where are we, man? And you get that conversation about this is what we're going to do. I remember specifically having a very clear conversation with Coach T, I think, in the last deal that I did. So going into year 10 and 11. Um, I had a very honest conversation with Coach T about where I was. And honestly, <laughs> trying to figure out what my career was going to be because you start mentioning year 10 and 11, those double-digit numbers, you start to question some stuff, you know, and I'm sure a guy as good as Joe Hayden, you know, was probably just like, man, what, what am I in this league now? I know you got a young guy that you're probably banking on being the guy moving forward, but that's where he kind of broke down a lot of stuff about me in that last meeting I had with Coach Tomlin by him saying, like, small stuff, like, Mo, every challenge we've given you, you've answered. So you got a shot in this league. You got a shot with us, but we got to see how the books work out. And we got to see what your price is and all those types of things. It's exciting. It's um, kind of scary because yeah, it sounds like it. <laughs> you can leave that. You can leave that locker room that night, go into that meeting on that Monday or Tuesday, meet with your position coach. And that'll be your last time playing the game ever, you know, 
or your last time in that city. It's <laughs> it's a lot that go in it. But if you know you had a good year, uh, if you know you have some stability with a team, it's fair. It's just your moment to get some reality about what you are as a player or truthfully a part of this too, what you mean to a team. There's a lot that goes into that exit meeting, man. And I hope these guys take the time to understand what are the questions I can ask? You know what that is, DK listeners? Everything. <laughs> There's a lot that goes into it. The last game the Steelers played, this was, I think, five years ago. Yeah. It was a home game. And Mike Mitchell, who's as outwardly emotional as anyone I've covered, uh, Mike Mitchell – took off his jersey and he was uh, throwing, you know, putting it into the, there's a, there's a, a basket for people who don't mm-hmm. know. A, they, they, they move it through the room and he, 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 he put his on top of the, the, the pile and he's walking back to his stall and he does a 180 and he goes back and he picks the shirt up again and he holds it like this up yeah. against himself. And he's, and he, says and, and only Mike Mitch could pull this off and convince you that it's authentic, right? And he, he pulls holds it up against himself and he said, This might be the last time hmm. I'm ever near this shirt again. And you know, and, and representing this team. It turns out it was. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm not gonna lie, Moan. Like my initial thought was like, come on, man. Because you know we're not we're not you okay yeah. we're, I don't, we don't ever pretend to be okay I'm an outsider in there and but I'm watching this and I'm thinking wow this is the more I saw of it it was like that's that's real yeah you know I, I, I remember and I've said this before <laughs> I, I knew getting that 12th year was going to be a challenge for myself and lo and behold it I was. Mean, it worked take it, out. Take it from somebody who was working the other side of that equation. <laughs> yeah. I, as I'm trying to find out information from them, uh, yeah. there was a lot that went into your getting that contract. It, it, it was, man. And I'll never forget the last game, though, of that last contract, though, DK. Uh, going out in that field in Baltimore, I never forget the scene. I'm seeing Baltimore celebrate on the other side. I'm watching all those things. That's why I never took for granted almost anything, because I've seen guys have good years and not play again. So for me, I remember giving Al a hug, looking up to his big, tall self and being like, man, I've enjoyed you. I appreciate you as a friend. And that continues to this day. But in that battlefield of playing the game, uh, that 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 last jersey, let's say, take, for instance, a young guy like Devin Bush. What's his future, DK? Five you know, snaps on Sunday. Five. That's that's why this 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 Black Monday exit meeting stuff is very important. Yeah, so it's, it's um it's it's pretty good stuff there. Bro. We can go more into it for sure, man. I'll tell you about having an exit meeting and then a coach get fired hours later. Let's talk oh, about let's that. do this when we come back. Welcome back to the Ramon Foster Show. As promised, he's on a roll. More from Moan on exit meetings. Yeah, exit meetings are unique because uh, I was actually talking to a buddy of mine in the league who's in the front office now, asking questions about, you know, training staffs, like who's safe and, you know, is there ever changes in training staffs and stuff like that? And the guy had to tell me, he was like, man, a bunch of stuff happens around the league as expendable as players and coaches. He was just like, we were, (laughs) it's funny he said this, he was just like, we were in a bubble. And Pittsburgh, he was like, that was Disneyland compared to everywhere else. I was like, really? Because we speak about st- stability. We speak about training room trust. You hear me brag about Coach Guimont all the time. Yeah, Why, Eric DK? Mm-hmm. He, he take care of him. And I bring up John Norwick's name and Sonia Ruflin and, and their group of uh, d- just always doing. Well, don't forget you, Rogers. Yeah, Rogers. Uh, you know, yeah. just that entire staff always has treated us well and good. But uh, I was asking questions about training staffs because I'm like, man, you just never really know Davion. So I can't leave Davion now or Dino just in Mm -hmm. case they see this. Uh, Shout out to that group, man, because they take good care of guys and there's a level of stability in dealing with them, too. Coach, I mean, Dr. Bradley all across the board. Uh, And the reason I brought that up is because change happens to everybody if you're not performing in the NFL. I've had a couple exit meetings, man, with coaches that I did the meeting. I'm feeling good about, you know, what we're doing going into the next year. They spoke highly of me because I had fairly good seasons, DK, for the most part. 
just had to sift out and figure out what was next. And one of the coaches, I had a meeting, and I knew he was leaving. And the whole time I'm thinking to myself, why When, when you say leaving, what do you mean? <laughs> he was taking another job somewhere else. Okay, it was yeah. already explained to so him. So you're sitting there in an exit meeting. This is a complete waste of time. Yeah, I'm thinking, like, what the hell am I in here for? <laughs> you're about to leave. And then the mm-hmm. other coach, I have this meeting, and I, I, I was in a hurry to have the meeting because I was so over the season and the guy just being real. <laughs> and I'm sitting there, and he's talking me through the stuff I did. Mo, you're a great leader. You played well, all this stuff. And I leave to go home, and in about three – I did the meeting at 12. I was done about 1.30. We're in our group chat. Breaks. Yep. He was <laughs> let go, DK. Yeah. I'm thinking to myself, why did I give myself up to this guy when he's already fired? But it's, it's a performance based league, though, DK. Yeah, and and the exit meetings for anybody who, who is not familiar with how these things go or wondering what they are, they're <coughs> excuse me, they're they're partially about evaluation, but they're way yeah. more about the future, aren't they? They are. They are about the future. Like they uh, don't sit there and go. And by the way, in week nine. You missed this block. No, absolutely yeah. not. We could talk about some stuff, but it's generalized of where you are as a pro. I'll never forget meeting with Munch. He was like, this is where my better years in the league came along for me. I think I ended up getting Munch around year five, six. Mm-hmm. And he was just like, I think you got a lot in left. He was like, my best years was years five to nine is what he said. Five to ten for a guy like Munch before he really had to taper back a little bit, and he still was a beast. Uh, but that that threshold of, of really growing as a pro, he was like, oh, this is beautiful. Let's roll with this. And um, just, just looking at how his meetings went and what we did, the expectation going into next year, if you were a guy that was up for a contract, especially during that Munch era, he will let you know. Like, I <laughs> – and it ended up being our, our our snake bite, too. The group that we had, we weren't leaving. That group was going to stay together, DK, as as much as, as they ever wanted it to be. And it ended up snake biting us in the end with us holding on for a while, too. So you get an outlook on what's what. I knew when Chris Hubbard was about to go. I had feelings that when Marcus Gilbert time was up in Pittsburgh. These are the things that happen in those meetings because you do speak about the future because the past is the past. They're going to review your tape and break it down however they need to if you're worthy of of being re-signed. But in general, nah, it's the future. And not just with this team, but in, in the NFL. How free are you as the athlete to speak your mind? You're probably not Ooh. the best one to ask because you yeah. do that in any setting. But, like, if you're first year, second year guy, do you are you free to say something like, you know what, coach, by the way, if only we had done things this way, I would have been a lot more productive for you. <laughs> you know? I, I think you do. And I'll be honest with you. Coach Tomlin invites that type of stuff. Tell me what you want out of this. How so do we get there? So you're Kenny Pickett. Yeah. Let, let's do this. Oh, okay, you're, beautiful. You're, yes. Oh, you know where I'm going here. So Kenny Pickett's sitting in that room. Who's in there, first of all? It's just Coach and, and uh, Kenny. And Kenny's going to meet with each coach it's, individually. It's coach- just Mike Tomlin and Kenny. Coach Tomlin. No, and no Kenny. obviously Kenny would have his own meetings with Mike Sullivan with with yes. Canada, whatever else. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. So he gets to the point where he's just sitting in a room with Mike Tomlin. Yes. Can he, he say to him, Hey coach, can we talk? This yeah. Coor- this coordinator. You know, you know that he- stuff they say about him on TV, the whole Saturday <laughs> thing and everything. Well, take it from somebody who very recently was playing on Saturdays, coach. But uh, they're kind of right. DK, <laughs> listen to me. Can he do that? And you know why he can do it? Because, one, the environment allows that to happen. Uh, I told you all the time, the environment in which you're able to operate in Pittsburgh is probably not like any other. You can say what you want to as long as you're right and you back that up. That's always been a philosophy there. Look, if we don't like something, say something. If it's not good, say something. I remember specifically a lot of guys before I even got to my meeting had already had conversations with coach about a specific uh, about a, a, a specific staffer that he had. And I brought it up and he was just like, yeah, we're going to address that. We've already had four guys bring this up, Moan. And I was just like, oh, so, yeah, that's a part of okay. it, too. The player is the product. And the best thing to do as a coach is to get the best out of that product. And if guys are underutilized, by the way, that meeting in which I said, like, a a guy was let go, well, 
that meeting had happened two or three (laughs) times before I had actually gotten to Coach Tomlin. So, yeah, DK, it's hard going to work, man, when you got to bang your head up into a wall. And and then on top of it, we got to go block 300 pounders or you expect me to, you know, run go route after go route after go route with no variety and what I'm supposed to do. So, yeah, if he has an issue with, you know, Matt Canada, yeah, Kenny, say what you need to because, buddy, I don't think you realize this, but you got the keys to the franchise right now. You've got the keys, and he's going to – this kid is so humble and so everything else, but at some point or other, he's going to understand that he's got the keys. Um, We've watched that uh, from afar in Cincinnati with the way Joe Burrow – Come on, it's a perfect example. It It is. is. Because Joe Burrow comes into that woe-begotten franchise – and everything is wrong there, including fake eggs. <laughs> and he's able to come in and say, hey, listen, I don't care how it was done here before, but with each passing victory, with each additional accomplishment that Joe had, he was able to up his influence. There, yes, right? sir. Yep. And all of a sudden, what do you know? Joe Burrow is more important than Paul Brown. Uh, it, it's just a, it's a different no, you know that that's serious though because I said Paul Brown, I meant Mike Brown. Mike Brown, but well, if, if this is the thing, Paul Brown Stadium, that's what it was. Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. Uh, with, with that being said, though, DK, there, there's a whole lot of truth in the role that the quarterback plays. Kenny got to understand it now. I'll say this publicly around kids that think he's a superhero, around adults that are respectable. You stay the same, Kenny Pickett. KP, stay the same way. But when it comes to the business of the Pittsburgh Steelers and honestly, the trajectory of your career, people gave Ben crap, DK, for years. I saw articles. Mm-hmm. I, I got tweets about it. You selfish bleep, 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 bleep. Mm-hmm. You always asking for this guy, that guy, this guy. Got to do it. He wasn't wrong, was he? Got to do it. <laughs> Got to do it. Ben was only ever wrong on one football front, in my opinion, in, in, in his career. And that was when he really resisted the idea of just staying in the pocket and everything else that the Rooney's wanted him to and everything. And eventually Ben kind of figured that out because he got sick of being thrown around. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. But I'm, I'm just speaking about as far as like draft capital and trying to get weapons offensively. Mm -hmm. I I try to explain this during my day job to a lot of people, but your quarterback is only as good as the weapons you surround him by and the protection you give him. I don't care how great a guy is. If he don't have one or the other or he's not demanding it, then you don't have the guy. When we come back, the only segment that matters. Let's stay home. Welcome back to the Ramon Foster Show and the only segment that matters. It's brought to you by the Get-Go Cafe and Market, where three expert chefs fine-tune every detail so that every sub, burger, salad, wrap, drink, and app is crafted for craveability. Order your favorite entry today at the Get-Go Cafe and Market. Better believe it. Moan, see this goofy smile on my face? (laughs) Yeah. That's because I have looked ahead to see the best Hey Moan entry we've had in a while. Uh Uh-oh. Ready? I don't don't know, but let's hear it. All right. Chris, uh, Chris Haysack says, Hey Moan, do you guys think it might just be a Good thing that the Steelers didn't make the playoffs. I'm having flashbacks of this team getting blown off the field in Kansas City last year, and I could see the same thing would have happened again. This season, I'd rather just have the higher draft pick. Well, you'd get the draft pick either way, man. Yeah. yeah you that do. does that, 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 The draft pick doesn't have anything to do with it, but I, I, I got to tell you, there's a part of me that's been wondering what Chris just asked myself. I'm not sure I have that answer. Man, is it better? I, I brought this up a little bit in the last show we did, DK, by saying we know what the results was going to be. You know, Coach Tomlin's, you know, comment about, yeah, we were trending up. We, you know, would much rather have been in the playoffs. I don't know if that's the case because it's just a gap. There's a gap of experience. There's a gap of play. They're as, not at the same level. They're not at the same level at, as as any team, I don't no. think, in the playoffs. Um, and, and I say that with a whole lot of respect for the guys that that clawed back from two and six. Mm-hmm. Like I said, I told you in, in, in our first segment, there were some times where I was just like, man, 
I'm running out of gas. And I knew my guys were running out of gas. There's only so many, many ways you can fight City Hall as far as creativity this late in the season and playmaking ability and guys being injured and not being in it. Like seeing ABB hurt a game, then Le'Veon's out for a game, going to, you know, New England, trying to figure out how the heck are we going to win this game in this crowd? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, as, as big as competitors as we are, the fight is there. But you know when the weapons aren't all sharp together. You know when, you know, there's been a little bit of a rift somewhere within, uh, not necessarily coaches, but just, like, how are we even surviving? I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Nine and eight this year. Um, you get your quarterback back. You get your wide receiver back. You got both running backs. We got to figure out, like, there's a lot that goes into it to where this group right now must be and continue to stay hungry because they didn't make it. I think there may be a bigger lesson learned by not making it this year than it is going in and getting molly whopped. I feel like there are two separate answers that could be given to this. One is the answer to the outside world, meaning to the public. Yeah. I actually do believe that it's better off for the public and the fan base for the Steelers to end right where they did. And by that, I mean winning against Cleveland. I mean winning four in a row, yeah. having beaten the Ravens, having gotten those couple late drives engineered by Kenny and Najee, having the dagger that was – stuck on that night on, on, on Christmas Eve on Franco's yeah. night uh, at Acrisure Stadium and having that memory be the last thing that you think of. And a lot of people talking today here in Pittsburgh about hope, about feeling positive about yeah. the team. Now, compartmentalize that. Move it outside where it belongs. Yeah. On the inside, every single individual <clears> – <throat> excuse me, associated with the Pittsburgh Steelers would want like hell to go to Orchard Park, New York yeah. and give it their very best. And if they had, mm -hmm. even if they had come up short, which again was going to be highly likely, the additional benefit to that is that Kenny Pickett, Najee Harris, and a lot of other guys, younger guys, yeah. the offensive line would have been able to say, hey, when I do get around to playing in a playoff game, it won't be my first. Yeah. Okay? Is that? I, my, my, my first road playoff game? No, 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 man. I was yeah. in Orchard Park last year. Okay? I've been in front of 73,000 drunken Western New Yorkers. <laughs> okay? I can handle the playoffs. I've been there. It would have been a terrific experience for them. Yeah. And that, to me, is the real separator here. Um, it's, it's just two totally different perspectives, you know, it is. And, and this is the other part too, going against Buffalo and Buffalo with the elements, with their situation with, uh, DeMar Hamlin being released, uh, from the hospital. Also awesome. now he's in Buffalo and then you, you know, that would have been now, this would have been the rare setting where both Pittsburgh and Buffalo obviously have a significant claim to DeMar Hamlin and Pittsburgh actually has a much greater claim. <laughs> yeah, okay. Let's be yeah, honest here. Okay, DeMar spent his whole life here. Yeah. Um, so I don't think you would have had a, you know, DeMar yeah. Hamlin come out and say, stick it to the Steelers or whatever. He, you know, he, no. he's a, he's a Steelers fan in his heart. But, but the team aspect of it though, emotionally, yes. they got, they got momentum. And I'll say this, the gap of points per game they have, which is 28, point something points per game and we're averaging 18 that's hard to compete against it just is no matter how many times that defense would drag an offense to the deep end of the pool and try to take them under that is a uh, that's a long road to actually take on whenever you you look at the position we're in right now especially but you know what a, a member of the Steelers media relations staff shared this thought with me uh, at Akershire Stadium this weekend he said you know what if you're the Buffalo Bills, you are so happy Miami <laughs> Dolphins are coming to town. And he's right. Yeah, he is right. Okay, because the Dolphins are a team that's going like this right now. Yeah. The Steelers are a team that's going like this. And <clears throat> you never know no. what would have happened up there. You yeah. never know. And the Bills 
the more factors like that that they eliminate in advance, the better their chance of making it to where they want to go. 100%. Uh, That's a really, really good question, Chris. We, we appreciate that. We definitely. appreciate everybody who uh, watches this show uh, or listens to it via podcasts and everything else here. We get asked all the time, where, where, how do I leave a hay moan? Um, anywhere you want. Anywhere you want to. Or, On yeah, YouTube or, to comment, you got to have an account. Uh, but they can go to your app, DK, DK Pittsburgh Sports. Uh, I would say tweet me, but I get a lot of tweets at us anyway. Yeah, uh, there's a good chance that'll get buried. But yeah, yeah, that'll get buried. So, yeah, that's how. Just reach out and make sure you put Hey Moan with lots of exclamation points. Let's do it again tomorrow, Moan. Absolutely. Absolutely.